Good evening, uh, good morning for some partners who are in Japan. It's quite uh, early in the morning for Japanese colleagues. Um, we are very pleased to welcome you to this uh, second webinar focused on PORSAV. So what is PORSAV? PORSAV is a European funded project uh, that was initiated at the time of the COVID. And the aim of this uh, project was to try to find uh, solutions uh, to prevent uh, the dissemination of the uh, virus inside of the operating theaters or inside of the hospitals. And of course, by extension, progressively with the change in COVID management, we looked also at the potential uh, um, fatalities related to the smoke, uh, surgical smoke in the theaters. And of course, still looking at the potential um, uh, microbial uh, contamination that can occur. So originally based on the COVID, uh, we have an extension of a project and that's why we are running this uh, second session. So uh, I'm very pleased uh, to share this session with uh, Silvana Peretta, who will uh, introduce the different participants. Thank you, Silvana. Thank you, Bernard. Um those who had to wake up very early, but uh, I think it's uh, worth the while. I'm sitting here at, at Ericat in Strasbourg with, uh, uh, to my right side, uh, Pietro Riva, who's an upper GI surgeon who recently joined the team. And uh, it is my great pleasure to co-chair this session with Bernard, but also with Dr. Uh, Debbie Keller, who's an assistant professor of, uh, of surgery. She's a brilliant surgical entrepreneur and scientist, and uh, she will join uh, in August uh, the um, uh, Marx Colorectal Lung Canal Medical Center. And uh, she's going to also be our first uh, speaker, talk about, talking about the current guidelines. What do we know about surgical smoke and potential infection risk? Debbie. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction and the pleasure of speaking. So COVID started with so much uncertainty and fear. I think it's very important that we talk about, at this point, two years in, what do we actually know about this virus? First, we know it's an RNA virus and we know the size of it. We know how long the half-life is. It's usually one hour, although some particles remain stable for up to 16 hours. We know that UV light greatly reduces the stability of the virus, uh, while humidity and lower temperatures can increase the stability and give it greater lifespan. We also know that there's been viral uh, RNA detected in feces, blood, serum, saliva, and urine, but it hasn't been live. It's very rare for live virus to be detected. So just having virus detection is not analogous to having it be uh, contagious. No live viral DNA or RNA has been detected in peritoneal fluid to this point. And we also know how it's transmitted through close contacts, droplets, and aerosols. It happens when we're breathing, it happens when we're talking, and it happens to greater degrees when we increase the volume of our voice which is why masking helps in all situations. So depending on the size of the particles is dependent on how it is transmitted. Droplet spray is for larger particle size. It can happen directly through touch or indirectly through fomites. Um, and if droplets are inhaled, then they behave as aerosols. So aerosols are airborne transmission of smaller particles, less than five nanometers. And they're absorbed via the respiratory mucosa or across the conjunctiva of the eyes. It can be during exhalation when we breathe in the aerosols that are produced from the nose and mouth of those who are infected, and no direct contacts needed for that, or during inhalation when the microscopic particles and aerosols are evaporated through droplets that already exist. And there are aerosol generating procedures. We know these already, obviously intubation and extubation, but also endoscopy, which is very pertinent for us, upper and lower and bronchoscopy, as well as TEEs, surgical smoke produced by heat generating devices, and NG tube insertion, which is something we don't often think of, as well as CPR, bag mass ventilation, during suctioning, inserting chest tubes, thoracotomies, and tracheotomies. 
Now there are guidelines that have been put out and updated multiple times for management. And this is the uh, intercollegiate college guidelines, uh, which is basically telling us to stratify patients. If they are elective patients, which they have been isolated for 14 days and screened, and you're in a COVID cold site, uh, you can go ahead with surgery if negative. If it's acute patients and status is unknown, CT abdomen, CT pelvis are usually done. You should also get a CT of the chest so you can diagnose for sure if they are COVID positive or not. Well, these are the patients that can't wait for surgery, whereas elective patients, we can wait if they're positive. All theater staff should be using full PPE if possible. And we know that laparoscopy carries risk of some aerosol transformation, um, so caution is advised at this point still. So it should be considered in individual cases based on the intercollegiate guidelines currently. Upper GI procedures are noted as high aerosol generating procedures and full PPE is always recommended and only emergency endoscopic procedures should be performed. And this was just updated, so things to talk about and move from here. Now in the United States and in Europe, SAGES and EAES put out recommendations that were constantly updated during the introduction of the virus with a rapid response to even still continue to be updated with the best available information so that we can perform safe surgery and keep ourselves safe. And they're similar, you know, minimize the OR staff, make sure everyone wears PPE, postpone elective cases, hold meetings virtually if possible, make cases virtual if possible. They do stratify that there's little evidence of MIS risk that's specific to COVID-19. And with the proven benefits of reduced length of stay and complications with MIS, they encourage it. But they also encourage devices to filter release of CO2 and minimizing uses of energy sources. And then practical measures are just covering the risk of COVID-19, um, limiting the number of people that are around, testing patients, and ensuring for endoscopy procedures, everyone wears PPE and um, doesn't perform unnecessary procedures. Now, why the risk with laparoscopic surgery? It's really about the pneumoperitoneum that's generated and the smoke from the surgery. We know that aerosols are more concentrated due to the pneumo in laparoscopy, um, and that these cells contain cellular debris, they're potential carriers of the disease. So it's the uncontrolled release when we deinsufflate that can contaminate the environment. But the aerosols in the GI tract aren't originating from the respiratory tract. So there's a lower transmission risk. We have to keep that in mind. And as far as surgical smoke, we know that smoke can contain viral particles. We've seen this in HIV, hepatitis B, HPV, and other diseases that are viral. But the actual risk of transmission in surgical smoke is unknown. It's presumably small as the virus is only present in small amounts. There's no consensus about the risk difference between laparoscopy and laparotomy. And you would think that laparoscopy is actually safer because there's the barrier of the abdominal wall. Um, and then we also may be suctioning more precisely during laparoscopy. So it's something to keep in mind when we're saying that there's greater risk. Also, we don't talk about robotics at all. Should we assume the same risk with robotic surgery as laparoscopy? Something to discuss. But we do know that when there is transmission, there's greater risk. The mortality of patients that are operated on with COVID is over 50% with pulmonary complications. And at least a quarter of patients have 30-day morbidity. So it's not marginal. Patients should wait at least four weeks if they are positive before having surgery. And there's a recent systematic review and meta-analysis published that looked at articles up through October of 2020, and the best way that we can protect ourselves in the OR, which says the same things as our guidelines do. Minimize the aerosol-generating procedures, uh, create a negative pressure environment, and use great PPE. So the basic tenets from the 15 guidelines that are published right now that are common to test patients and delay positive elective cases. Use a dedicated OR for positive cases, Use appropriate PPE with proper doffing and donning of the equipment. Use a streamlined surgical team. OR techniques and patient positioning should be considered, including laparoscopy or robotic surgery. Prevent free dispersion of the pneumo and properly dispose of material and waste. So that's what we know. There's also things we don't know, and I know we're going to talk about some of them today. The amount of the virus that has to be present to trigger infection. There's also no data on the spread during surgery itself, how to manage asymptomatic patients in mild variants, which we're seeing now, and the preference for laparoscopy or robotic surgery over laparotomy in general. So in conclusion, at this point, 
we have to rely on real evidence and real experience from the two years we've had. We know that major surgery in COVID positive patients has major risks, whether it's diagnosed before or after surgery, but we can stratify patients in appropriate delayed cases. There's a potential small risk of transmission through MIS, but the same risk is there through all surgical cases. And the risk of infection and dissemination from the smoke plume are still evolving. So concern about unreleased and uncontrolled pressurized gas and MIS and electrocautery and open surgery is something that we'll talk about more today. But mitigation strategies and new technology can help with that. So thank you. Thank you very much, Debbie. Great talk. Um, I'd like to know if uh, there is any question in uh, within the panel that we have here at IRCAD and then see no if uh, so the far. audience can... No questions so far? So from the audience? No. From the audience and uh, questions? Bernard? Uh, <coughs> I think that we will probably continue with the next speaker. I think it's uh, Dean uh, who is talking a little bit also the same uh, problems, questions that we have today. And maybe we can mix a little bit the uh, new lecture and the lecture of uh, sure. Dean. Uh, Dean uh, Mikami is from the University of Hawaii and uh, he wasn't able to join us live today because he's in an airplane uh, but he was kind enough to send us his uh, presentation so now we'll go to this presentation and then we'll share a little bit uh, the different information that we got from you talk and from his talk and see a little bit what's the reaction of the audience. Okay. Thank you Debbie. Hi, my name is Dean Mikami, and today I'll be talking about risk mitigation strategies for aerosolization and surgical smoke. I want to thank Dr. Delamang and Dr. Keller for this opportunity to present at this conference. Here are my disclosures. So why is surgical smoke and aerosolization important? We know the dangers of surgical smoke include uh, over 150 chemicals and toxins that could be carcinogenic. Operating room smoke exposures are personnel to 27 to 30 unfiltered cigarettes daily. Half a million of our healthcare professionals are exposed to electrosurgical smoke every year. So what are the symptoms and signs of smoke exposure? So we know hypoxia, dizziness, eye irritation, nausea, vomiting, uh, sneezing are some of the symptoms. The most important risk mitigation factor we want to look at is viral transmission. And that will be one of the emphasis of this presentation. So the dangers of surface smoke to the patient include carbon monoxide, uh, preventing oxygen binding, carboxyhemoglobin uh, that lowers oxygen levels, methemoglobin causes hemoglobin to not function correctly, it can cause false pulse oximeter readings and port site metastasis. The mitigating of the risk of surgical smoke in the OR includes uh, using a multimodal system, including capture devices, vacuum sources, and inline filtration. Surgical smoke particle size can differ depending on the type of energy device that we use in the operating room. For instance, an ultrasonic scalpel can produce surgical smoke particles between 5 microns and 0.5 microns. Using electrosurgical pencils can produce particles as small as 0 0.07 microns in size. Filtration in general. We know our N95 respirators are designed to filter out 95% of particles that are 0.3 microns and larger. Our HEPA filters can filter out 99.97% of particles that are 0.3 microns and greater. And our ULPA filters, or our ultra-low particle air filters, can filter out 99.999% of particles that are 0 0.12 microns or greater. So next, I would like to talk about some of the mechanisms of filtration. There are five common recognized mechanisms of filtration, including straining, inertia impaction, diffusion, electrostatic attraction, and interception. The main two um, filtration uh, mechanisms we use with our N95 masks are diffusion, 
with ra random Brownian motion and electrostatic attraction. So for straining, as a particle moves through our filter medium, it gets caught between the fibers, as um, depicted in our straining uh, cartoon. For inertial impaction, the fibers hit directly on the filter medium, and the uh, medium captures the uh, particle. For interception, um, the filter media with its uh, fibers can actually intercept or catch the particle as it um, goes through the filter medium. For electrostatic attraction, the particles are charged uh, along with the filter mechanism, uh, creating attraction to the fil filter mechanism. And random Brownian motion um, depicts the particles are not moving in a straight line, but are moving in a random motion. And this uh, increases the filter media picking up the particle. The next topic I would like to talk about is the hierarchy of controls that we use in the operating room. The National Institutes for Occupational Safety and Health um, have, have come up with this diagram depicting the um, ways we eliminate risk in the OR as far as surgical smoke is concerned. Number one, the most important, elimination. So we physically remove the hazard. Uh, this is done by our OR ventilations where we have 15 exchanges per hour. We can substitute the hazard by uh, utilizing positive pressure or negative pressure operating rooms where we actually push uh, clean air into the OR and this uh, air that is in the OR is then filtered out, um, thus substituting the hazard. Engineering controls um, are used by only having the necessary people or personnel in the OR. So we isolate people from the hazard. In administrative controls, we change the way people work. We educate our OR staff and our uh, surgeons on the mitigation techniques that we should be using in the operating room. And lastly, the least effective way is we protect the, our, our healthcare workers by having them wear uh, PPE in the operating room. So filtration in the operating room is used for all open laparoscopic endoscopic procedures. It is a multifaceted approach, which includes proper room filtration and ventilation, appropriate personal protective equipment, and smoke evacuation devices with a suction and filtration system. The next concept we'll be talking about is engineering controls and room ventilations. So most operating rooms uh, operate under a positive pressure environment. Uh, we have about 15 exchanges per hour, so about five exchanges every 20 minutes. After five minutes of electrosurgical use, it can raise the concentration of particles in the room from 60,000 to 1 million particles per cubic feet through the entire room. After 20 minutes of electrosurgical use, positive pressure air circulation reduces the particle concentration back to baseline levels. Next, I'll be talking about evacuation and filtration mechanisms that we use in the OR. Number one, ensure that you, you have a proper alpha filter, which includes a triple filtration system. Uh, that includes a pre-filter, an alpha filter, and a charcoal filter. When using inline suction, you want to make sure your inline suction has an alpha filter um, between the wall suction and the suction canister. For smoke evacuators, we have to be sure that alpha filter systems are used. Um, you need to check the filter life indicator before cases and to make sure that the device is working properly before your case. Other capture devices that we use uh, within the OR, including our surgical pencils, uh, oftentimes will have a suction apparatus hooked up to the pencil itself. We want to use these uh, smoke uh, evacuators within two inches of our surgical field. If you can detect an odor, that means your smoke is not being captured, you may have inefficient air movement, or the filter needs to be replaced in your system. So during the pandemic, information about the SARS-CoV-2 virus was overwhelming. 
So uh, definitely we've learned a lot of lessons uh, during the pandemic. We know that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is an RNA virus. It has a range of 0 0.06 microns to 0.14 microns. Uh, COVID-19 is the disease that results from the SARS-2 COVID virus. And the SARS virus has been found in all different body fluids, including nasal uh, pharynx, upper respiratory tract, and lower respiratory tract, the entire GI tract from the mouth to the rectum, saliva, sputum, throat and nasal swabs, blood, bile, and feces. So how does the SARS-CoV-2 virus compare to other viruses in terms of size? So once again, we know the SARS-2 COVID virus uh, has a range of 0 0.06 microns to 0.14 microns. Other viruses that are, are commonly seen in our surgical patients, including hepatitis viruses, are much smaller, anywhere from 0 0.02 microns to 0 0.06 microns. Um, the human papillomavirus is also a very small virus with the size of 0 0.05 microns. Our, uh, other viruses that we tend to uh, see in our surgical patients, including influenza, is rather large, 10 to 70 microns. Um, bacteria has a size of 0.3 microns, and the HIV virus, 0.12 microns. So a common question I get asked uh, from my patients is, how many virus particles does it take to get you infected? So we know from uh, past studies, the norovirus, it takes about 18 viral particles to get infected. Influenza, very low viral particle load to get you infected, about 10 viruses. The SARS-CoV-2, uh, we don't have an answer yet, but we predict it's a very low dose, especially with um, the variants that we've seen in the past, like the uh, Omicron variant. So what can we do to mitigate the risk of surgical smoke in open surgery? If surgical smoke is not evacuated, it can be detected for up to 20 minutes after the energy device is used within the operating room. Porcine studies have found bacteria and HPV viruses in surgical smoke in the blend and the cut mode. It was not found in higher voltages while using the coag mode, but these higher um, coag mode voltages increased the risk of wound infections. The risk to the OR personnel was lower when the OR personnel wore N95 masks. And we know that hepatitis B viruses can be found in surgical smoke. Options for mitigation of smoke in open surgery. This includes using an attached suction device to your electrosurgical pencil that is hooked up to an alpha filter. A regular suction wand is capable of efficiently capturing 95 to 99% of smoke, assuming adequate levels of suction, when the suction device is within two inches of the smoke source. Mitigation factors for laparoscopic surgery. Number one, decision for ports should be as small as possible to allow passage of ports, but not allow for leakage around the ports. Number two, an ultrafiltration or alpha filter should be used if available. Number three, keep your pneumoperitoneum as low as possible. Number four, suction of CO2 or smoke with standard suction irrigators connected to a non-filtered reservoir should be minimized. Number five, electrosurgical unit should be set to the lowest possible setting for the desired effects. And number six, during desulfation, all escaping CO2 gas and smoke should be captured with an ultrafiltration system, and desulfation mode should be used on your insulation device if available. Special considerations for infectious disease in addition to standard smoke mitigation. All members in the OR should wear N95 masks. If converting to open surgery, Desulfation should be achieved first prior to opening unless it's deemed an emergency. Specimens should be removed once all the CO2 gas and smoke is filtered out. Suture closure devices should be avoided. The fascia should be closed after desulfation. Number five, hand assisted devices should be avoided also. If it's used to remove larger specimens and protect the wound, 
it can be placed after deselectation. In a recent publication by Dr. Scott, Protecting Surgical Teams During the COVID-19 Outbreak, Structural frequent communication before key events is important. Assume the entire OR will be contaminated. Choose protective equipment effective against aerosolization particles. Adapt surgical techniques to reduce exposure risk. And use a buddy system for donning and doffing protective personal equipment. During the COVID-19 pandemic, SAGES and the EAES came up with recommendations on the surgical response to COVID-19. So much of what we talked about today is highlighted in this slide. So all staff should wear um, personal protective equipment. Uh, for laparoscopic surgery, we should use devices to filter out release CO2, uh, minimize use of surgical energy, uh, we should test all patients prior to elective surgery and emergency surgery if possible. Dedicate OR for COVID-19 patients. And for endoscopy, all staff also should wear uh, the appropriate PPE and avoid advanced procedures if possible. In conclusion, protect yourself and your OR team from surgical smoke and potential infectious aerosolization. Adapt surgical techniques to reduce exposure risk. Utilize a multifaceted approach, including proper room filtration and ventilation, appropriate personal protective equipment, smoke evacuation devices with a suction and filtration system. Thank you very much for your time. great amount. Okay. Yes, and then we would like to ask the audience, and we did actually, if uh, you're, ac you're following the current guidelines, and Pietro, you want to comment on the poll? So apparently yeah, so we have a, a positive answer in 80% uh, of the participants. And, so they uh, are following the guidelines? Yeah, they are following the guidelines, yes. Okay. And we are going to send the second one. The second question is, do you actually still uh, routinely test all your patients for COVID-19 infection before you bring the patient for an elective case to the OR? Uh, if you can answer the, uh, the survey. So 
Mostly yes. It's running in front of our eyes. We have about 120 participants to the webinar. So, so 78, 79% yes, they're still testing and about 20% no, they're not testing, which is, uh, we are still testing everybody before uh, the surgery. I don't know what's your practice, but uh, that's we what are. we do. We are as well. You are as well, and I'd, I'd be interested to know if Pietro, you can uh, you can uh, go to the next uh, uh, poll. If uh, uh, if um, uh, Debbie, you mentioned that there is a four week uh, uh, delay that should be respected uh, in order to avoid major complication after uh, during surgery in patients who were infected by COVID nineteen, mm -hmm. and I would be curious to see if they are. Uh, and everybody's saying yes, we do. Most of them. Mm -hmm. 80, 88% are, are, are sticking to the protocol. I think complication scares everybody, so yes. the dangerous things they don't do, so it's good. But how about asymptomatic patients? Are you still testing patients with no COVID uh, symptom uh, in, uh, in, uh, among the participants? Let's see what they have. We are testing everybody, symptomatic and, uh, of course, symptomatic, we are, mm -hmm. we are not operating, but uh, asymptomatic patients. Yes, most people are. Okay. And what, what about in the U.S.? You were saying that we are. You are. We are. Good um, you... It's mostly asymptomatic patients that are coming up and you know, testing positive and causing delays and cancellations and havoc, basically, in the surgery schedule. But the rates are going up right now in the United States, so it is an issue. And there is a question to say, is this going to be the same complication rate in an asymptomatic patient than it was you know, in a symptomatic patient at the beginning of the pandemic when the COVID surge data came out? It's real what, questions we uh, need to answer. What was the range of uh, positivity in these patients who are totally asymptomatic going for, for, for surgery? When you're testing these patients or patients? About 20% of patients are coming back positive. Okay. Yeah. Which is That's significant. Significant. Mm -hmm. significant. Any, be, I encourage everybody to uh, write questions in the chat. You can also raise your hand if you want to uh, ask a question live. Don't be shy. Uh, and you, we will be delighted to, to hear your voice and uh, to talk to you directly. But uh, I think we can move on to the next presentation. And Dr. Watanabe, I know he's already connected. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's our pleasure. We enjoyed very much your presentation at SAGES. And uh, we are very excited to uh, hear it again. And, and um, Dr. Watanabe is going to talk about uh, surgical smoke coming from energy uh, devices. The floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. OK. Thank you for having me in this webinar. It's a great honor to be able to speak to you today. Maybe probably good evening, everyone, and good morning in Japan, I guess. I'm go going to introduce an overview of surgical smoke and then share our current research finding. First of all, let me summarize what surgical smoke is. Already Dr. Mikami told, summarized about the surgical smoke. Surgical energy devices generate smoke which contains a fine particle and ultra fine particle, including water, chemicals, volatile organic compounds, VOCs, dead and alive materials, and bacteria, viruses, and malignant cells. Dr. We all Watanabe, know just one second. Sorry, could you please go full screen with your slides because you're in presenter mode? Because we. Okay, sure. Wait a second. Yes, thank you. No problem. And, and you are a hero because I know in Japan is 1 a.m. So, <laughs> <laughs> just sorry thank about you so that. Much for breaks. doing, yes, yes. Wait a second. I'm not, I'm not sure why. No, no, it's a condivision, I guess. How about this? Let's see. Wait a second. I'm so sorry. Don't worry. Do 
Pietro, while Dr. Watanabe is working on the presentation, any questions from the audience? Um, there is a specific question about the treatment uh, for COVID in case of, uh, uh, in case the doctor um, get in touch with an asymptomatic patient after surgery, if there's a role for COVID medication as a prophylaxis. Yeah. But, uh, Dr. Watanabe, it's okay. It's perfect. Okay. Thank Sorry you. about that. Thank you very much. Okay. So we, so oh, the surgical radiology devices have generated a lot of things already I explained. We all know today surgical smoke has a potential health hazard for both patient and the surgical team. So more than 150 chemicals and the toxic substances have been identified in surgical smoke. When tissue is destroyed with energy devices, these toxic gases are produced. We know that it smells bad and unhealthy. And the particle in surgical smoke generated are very, very small and within the respirable branch. These particles can reach the region of the lung and they are also accumulated with toxicities. From the literature, monopora generates the smallest particle, smaller than 0.1 micron. Laser creates the bit larger particle 0.3 micron, and the ultrasonic scalpel creates the largest particle, 0.35 to 6.5 micron. However, the ultrasonic study used the particle counter that only corrected and uh, evaluated the information of the particle size of that range, only that range. There are no information about the particle size distribution smaller than 0.35 micron and larger than 6.5 micron. In addition, surgical smoke generated only by ultrasonic bone scalpels, not ultrasonic sears, were analyzed. The evidence of surgical smoke generated by ultrasonic sears and vessel sealing systems are scant. In general, these relatively large particles flow greater distance up to one meter in fact, small particles can spread instantly throughout the room. The closer you are, the more surgical smoke you would inhale. The risk of the smoke exposure depends on, the own, depends on oral airflow system and the surgical technique and the type of energy devices, how to use the devices and the target organs and the use of surgical smoke evacuators, etc. Limited data are available on particle size of surgical smoke generated by advanced energy devices, such as ultrasonic scissors and vessel sealers that are used universally in our practice, especially in minimally invasive surgery. As you can see here, we found that advanced energy devices consistently generate the surgical smoke particle ranging from 0.1 micron to 0.10 micron with greater concentration in the 0.1 to 0.3 micron zones. There's no difference between among the surgical energy devices. No significant difference in each range, but a greater number of particles were conducted, counted in the liver than in the mesentery. Ultrasonic sears generated a large amount number of particles than vessel sealing devices in almost all zones. As you can see here, we apply the strong beams of light to enhance the visualization of surgical smoke generated by different devices. Any of these devices generate surgical smoke the risk is underestimated owing to limited visualization in the clinical setting. Although the smoke appears relatively similar, the toxic level varies in terms of volatile organic compounds, VOCs. I would say VOCs are like a formaldehyde, toluene, fatty acid. There are a lot of VOCs. So there's our preliminary data. You can see here in the monopolar devices below, the higher power setting, the more VOCs you generate. The other question is the difference among the set energy devices. Ultrasonic series and the vessel series generates almost no VOCs, 
we can say advanced surgical energy is less toxic than monopolar energy devices. This is related to the interaction between the arc discharge and the plasma production resulting in radical reactions. Those advanced devices provide energy, energy without arcing, so they don't produce VOCs. Here are the major symptoms caused by exposure to VOCs, respiratory and cardiovascular symptoms, such as cough, bronchitis, asthma, COPD, et cetera, inflammation of the eyes and the watering eyes, headache and the nausea, dizziness. There are also known the mutagenic and the carcinogenic effect. Oral staff can also explain fatigue, skin irritation, and allergies. There are risks to the patient in minimal invasive surgery procedure. This study reported the level of toxic substances increased after lab cholecystectomy. Infectious, infectious risks. Several bacteria and viruses have been identified in the smoke. They are caused that gynecologic surgeon and assistant nurses who perform laser treatment for HPV-related disease developed the laryngeal polyps. The literature mentioned that surgical smoke is more likely to contain the viable agents when large and low temperature particles are generated. However, in the previous research, only bone cutting devices and the wound irrigation jet devices has been studied. So we don't really know the potential risk of advanced energy devices. Particle in surgical smoke may contain the, the COVID virus. There's also no current evidence to detect the viable COVID-19 virus in surgical smoke and the intracorporeal gas during the MIS procedures. It is also very difficult to evaluate the biological activity of viral DNA detected in surgical smoke. So the, the actual risk is yet unknown. Sometimes the risk is underestimated because of the limited visualization in the clinical setting. Surgeons don't believe in something that they, don't, they cannot see. Let me visualize the surgical smoke here. You will be surprised. Fine, part, fine or ultra fine particle flow or longer than you expected because the corner of the room are not effectively ventilated this is a limitation of the most oral air ventilation system today. Air ventilation system in the oral provided a clean environment around the patient from the seating to the patient, basically to the prevent the surgical side infection. It is not intended to reduce surgical smoke or clean the entire room. We can protect the patient, which is good, but it is hard to protect the oral team member from surgical smoke. Here, I will share the image, images illustrating the impact of operating lights on the OR flow. You can see here the difference between the OR light, light above patient versus the off center, slightly off center position. Operating room lights can block clean air, clean air flow from the ceiling. The surgical team needs to be aware of this. As you, as you can see here, we can decrease the risk of the risk significantly by using a smoke evacuator. You can see visually how effective a smoke evacuation evacuation device is. During MIS procedure, we might lose visibility in the surgical field due to smoke resulting in the potential delay of procedure uh, or unintended injury. In my in minimal invasive surgery, the risk might not be significant when comparing open surgery. However, when inserting the or removing the instrument, smoke leaks out of port. We have to be aware of this. If you insert the instrument to the port, you can see here the uh, surgical smoke 
this out of port. Therefore, we should apply the best practice to minimize the leak. Incision for ports should be as small as possible, keep low CO2 pressure, and use a smoke evacuator, etc. In summary, surgical smoke contains the toxic gases, the vapors, and it can be generated by any energy devices and it is a hurdle to patient and or personal. Thank you. Thank you very much, very Dr. Much, Watanabe. Dr. Watanabe. Fantastic presentation. We were all uh, um, glued to the screen watching uh, the, uh, the smoke coming out of uh, our, our patients. So we will probably all die from cancer in the OR if we don't take action. And yeah. as you said, now we see, now we know. Uh, so I, I, I think this is the perfect introduction to the rest of the of the webinar, which is really being concentrated on uh, how we can, what action can we take in order to uh, uh, to stop this from uh, from uh, from happening. I, I am curious to ask one question. Um, nobody mentioned this, or maybe I missed it, but there are safe um, uh, uh, safe use of energy uh, rules and regulations, and actually also a um, a, a, a certification that should be taken by every single surgeon using energy device that was put together uh, by, by SAGES and now has been adopted also by the um, European Society of Endoscopic Surgery. I'm curious to know and to ask uh, Debbie uh, if uh, she's aware of any action being taken to update those guidelines to include uh, what we have just seen and to include problems related to uh, infection, COVID-19, but in general all infection and potential cancerogenic effect of, of smoke for the personnel, well, not, not only for the, 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 the surgeon. Um, I know that Sages and Sages and EAES continually update their general guidelines. I don't believe that FUSE has been updated yet, but I'm sure it's a work in progress as new information is coming out and some from one of our speakers. What about in Japan, Dr. Watanabe? Have you, what action have you taken? Have you updated your guidelines or is in process? So I'm updating the information from our research on the website using our website. And the Japanese Surgical Society the site that our, you know, provides the link of our website. And, uh, you know, we are up, action, actively update the information. Okay. And uh, also I'm sharing the, my research findings to SAGES FUSE members. So they know most of the my research project. Perfect. And, and what, what uh, while, well, Pietro will pose one question uh, asking what, what kind of uh, smoke controlling uh, guidelines uh, each, each, each of you have seen being applied to, to the, their, their own institution and hospital, maybe more than one. So we would we'll be curious to know. I'm going to ask a, a, among the, uh, the speakers here and the, and the panel, who uses what? Do you use now ultrasonic? Do you use uh, 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 vessel sealers? Uh, what do you do in your practice? And have you ever thought about this kind of uh, side effects? Sorry, me. Um, yes, 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 I do use ultrasonic. I do use vessel sealers. I do try to minimize using any electrosurgical units possible. Um, we'll go for scissors more than hooks and other uh, more smoke generating equipment in robotic procedures. Uh, we do think about it. We try to use uh, specialized filtration as much as we can. But at the end of the day, it's you know doing the safest thing for the patient, doing the best surgery we can do, and then just trying to minimize as much as possible with the tools. Bernard? <coughs> yeah, personally, I'm using the, the vessel sealer, so the bipolar system. Mm -hmm. And I was very pleased to see that it's probably the safest one. And uh, the, the comments are, uh, uh, about robotic surgery is quite interesting because when we're looking at people doing robotic surgery, a lot of people are moving from the usual instruments, harmonic uh, or bipolar uh, sealing device, to the hook because of the, of the robot. <clears throat> and I was very impressed by the results of the study of Dr. Watanabe showing that the monopolar surgery is the higher risk. Mm -hmm. And today with the robotic, which is sort of an evolution, we're using a system that is more harmful than the 
uh, um, uh, the harmonic system, the ultrasonic system, or the bipolar oscillator. So it's, it's quite interesting to see that by moving from one technology, which is very sexy, we're creating potentially more problems. So we have to, this is a very important piece of information. We should think about that or using very sophisticated uh, protecting device mm -hmm. uh, against uh, smoke. So Absolutely. very important message from this lecture. And, and, and I think also that uh, what you showed very nicely is not only what kind of instruments do you use, and of course monopolar is the one that is generating the most of smoke, but also how you set it up. Yeah. And I think that if we if we go around in the in the, uh, uh, all the participants of the webinar, we all come from different setting, and I'm not sure that we all check what is the setting before we start operating. So that should be something that we should do in the interest of mm -hmm. the surgery and the patients, but also in the interest of the uh, our, of our interest and the personnel that's working with us. What was the result so of the poll? So we have some uh, results from the pool, and uh, so. Um, the question was, uh, which of these uh, smoke uh, mitigation actions did you did uh, your hospital adopted them during uh, and after the pandemic? And so, the, in the first place, we have uh, trockers incisions as small as possible, with the sixty five percent of uh, people uh, using it. On the second place, we had uh, to keep the, the pneumoperitoneum as uh, low as possible. Then uh, the third one is uh, to set the electrosurgery units uh, as low as possible. Which percentage? 41%. Uh, okay. And uh, thir fourth, we have uh, at the same 27%, we have uh, ultrafiltration, so smoke evacuation system or filtration, and a minimization of CO2 suction with the standard uh, uh, suctioning or irrigation devices. And uh, at the very last uh, place, uh, we have desufflation of CO2 with an ultra um, filtration system or with uh, a proper uh, insufflator. Very interesting. Yeah, so only 16% of people are using it. Do you, do you have some comments on that, Dr. Watanabe? Thank you. So interesting re result. So the smoke evacuator is most effective to minimize, you know, minimize the, the risk of surgical smoke, of course. And I, I'm very surprised. <laughs> At the lowest, set the lowest energy device low as set as low as possible is very important as well i think thank you so in terms of infectious infectious risk yeah. yes lesson to be learned for everybody yeah that that's very interesting because we can continue in the program and uh, that's the 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 moment for introduction of the 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 guy who has really imagined uh the uh uh, POSAF project, so this system that uh, would help surgeons protecting not only the surgeons but the other staff. Uh, John Odi is the CEO of an uh, Irish uh, company called uh, Paleare, and together with Ronan Kyle from uh, UCD in, uh, in uh, Dublin, they were thinking about uh, developing some devices to try to control this problem with the gas aerosolization. And as I was mentioning at the introduction of this uh, webinar that was developed in this European uh, funded project. And uh, John will give some rationale for the uh, development and uh, the innovation in this, uh, in this field. So John, thank you again for, uh, for having this uh, brilliant idea and uh, developing this project. Uh, with us. Thank you very much, Bernard. And um, I suppose if we cast our minds back to, I guess it was March 2020, I mean, there was a lot of activity going on around respiratory masks and reducing leaks and non-invasive ventilation was becoming a big problem. You know, there was, you know, suggestions that really CPAP was dangerous and we should move away from non-invasive modalities. And amongst that whole thing, you know, when I was looking at the leaks around the mask, I thought, well, you know, we've similar leaks in surgery. And um, so I, I really, I suppose I got talking with Ron and Cal, who we'd been collaborating with on some other projects. And um, so very quickly, we, we prototyped some concepts, which were like a lot of first uh, prototypes, these huge rings. <laughs> and um, 
then I suppose, you know, they, they worked, but they were rather big. And um, rather fortuitously, around the early summer, the EU came out with a program looking for solutions to address uh, COVID in, in, in all their sense. It wasn't just specifically around the area of, of um, medical devices, but, you know, everything from apps and so on, so on. So um, so we'd obviously worked very closely with Ronan. We'd worked very closely with ERCAD. And I suppose at the stage we were at back in March and April, there was really no sense how big a problem this was going to get. I mean, laparoscopic surgery was was almost being um, <laughs> poo-pooed as a way forward. And uh, the need to go uh, backwards uh, into open surgery was actually being advocated. So um, this was a problem. A lot of laparoscopic surgery had stopped. And really we didn't have a handle on how large the problem would get. Um, are you hearing me okay, by the way? Just just check, are you hearing me okay? Perfect, yeah. perfect. Very job. good, okay. So um, really that was the birth of the PORSAV project. It was an EU funded project standing for um, protection of OR staff uh, from aerosolized virus. And of course, not just OR, but also the endoscopy suite. And um, I suppose one of the things that was very prevalent back then was supply chain. Um, everybody was struggling to get basic things like respiratory filters, respiratory tubing. And one of the things we had to consider was that if this became a very large problem, we needed to have a partner that could scale this to the millions in, in a very quick order. So the PORSAV project, like most European projects, really was as one of, of partners of a number of different uh, companies. Don't, and yes. Don't, sorry, we don't see your slides. I don't know if you do have slides. I guess oh, you do. Yes, I do. Yeah. Yes. I, uh, Could you please share them? OK, can you see them now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. OK, so um, the like a lot of European projects, they're, they're partnership based. So in this in this particular project, we had uh, AirCAD. We had uh, ourselves, uh, um, Pagliari. Um, uh, we had the Matter Hospital, University College Dublin, and we had Steripac, a large contract manufacturer, and a professional project management organization called Pintail. So, our role, Pagliari, was really the development of the product, and you're going to see a little more about this in in the the ensuing talk. So I won't talk too much about the products, other than in a generic sense. So, really, the the first product, uh, Leak Trap, comprises of a series of vacuum rings, and uh, one which is stuck to the surface of the abdomen, and the other which is stuck to the uh, the top of the trocar. And you saw some elegant pictures earlier on um, of trocar leak. And the objective here was that if a leak was coming out, if there was a poor seal, et cetera, et cetera, then you know, suck that gas away through the, the vacuum system. <coughs> so that's the principle of leak trap, to trap leaks. And secondly, for endoscopy, you know, we wanted a solution that similarly protected the endoscopist and uh, Dr. Paredes' talk will, will cover that. So our role in the project was to complete the, the design to a stage that it could be used clinically, uh, develop the various regulatory and risk file documentation that are necessary to do trials, uh, particularly in Europe, um, undertake the regulatory certification testing, um, European notified body and FTA submissions, and then set up a vacuum unit manufacturing line. This device can be used with a, a high flow surgical evacuator uh, system, um, but we've been working on some further developments to improve the, the, the um, vacuum level and the amount of flow. Because one thing one has to bear in mind is that you don't just have one trocar, you could have five. And if you've got five trokers, you could have 10 of these. You know, So there's a lot of flow required to be evacuated. And a lot of work had gone into characterizing just how much flow was needed indeed to, to achieve a, a satisfactory um, vacuum. Um, Steripac then, I mean, the, these are one of the larger contract manufacturing companies in Europe and essentially they were tasked with establishing a manufacturing line for those components that we would want to be able to scale to millions in, in, in a very, very quick order. 
the clinical eval validation then was was um, really in two sites with uh, UCD taking the the lead for this task and um, really it was interesting that the Schlieren technology was seen in one of the I think in one of the earlier presentations as well and uh, we were lucky to have an expert in sharing technology in UCD. And so UCD were tasked with coming up with a way to not only image the, um, the leaks um, coming out from the trocars, but to actually quantitatively assess the degree of those leaks, the spread of those leaks, and the velocity of those leaks. And we'll hear a little about that later on. Um, obviously, these were trials, even though they're very innocuous devices, um, within Europe, unfortunately, we don't really distinguish between low risk and high risk devices in terms of the clinical investigation process. So extensive ethics and complementary involvement was required to allow us to evaluate these devices. Um, perhaps it, it, it must be said, you know, we were in the middle of a crisis, but uh, it, the, the process was still the process. So it, it did ultimately take us six to nine months to trial devices for an emergency situation. Um, secondly, or thirdly rather, the clinical validation, um, really this is the, the key task that you're going to hear a bit more about later, of the leak trap and inner trap devices um, was the, the, you know, the key clinical work that was undertaken in this project. And finally, uh, the, the clinical investigation report needs to be prepared both for the EU and for publication. And finally, um, you know, as with any technology, we need to educate the, the community around the extent of the problem. And indeed, today's uh, meeting is, is one aspect of that. Um, develop training materials for live courses. Um, engage with the uh, professional societies such as SAGES, EAES and AFS uh, to promote and improve leak management awareness and training. I, I must say, I... I too was rather shocked at that 16% <laughs> figure in, in, in the survey just presented there. So um, perhaps a little more engagement with the societies around these would be something that would be a beneficial output from this project. And finally, ERCAD, which is one of the leading surgical training centers in the world, has, has training sites all over the world. And um, therefore, if we wanted to get out the the message around this this whole topic, you know, what what better place to to set up training centres? So there were the four main facets of the Porsav project, and I think what I'll do now is I'll, I'll pass back to our chair, and uh, you'll hear a little more about the clinical aspects, which are of course the most interesting aspects today. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, and thank you for being the uh, the uh, initiator of such a uh, a, uh, a collaboration. Uh, it's always a pleasure to work both with you and your your team. I uh, you were upgraded because I noticed that on the program you are Italian now. So I think that we have been working <laughs> for so many years together that now you get honorary. You can tell from my accent, Savannah. Yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. You're more than welcome uh, in Italy. I have, two, I have two words of Italian. Ciao oh, yeah. is one. Yeah. So uh, I, I think we can we can take pronto. Pronto, yes, pronto, uh, subito. Uh, so grazie, John, and then we're going to move to the. Uh, to the to the other Irish of of the team, uh, Professor Ron Kyle. Ron is a dear friend. Uh, Bernard already introduced him, but he's a um, chief of surgery at Matter Hospital University College in Dublin. Uh, Ronan is a brilliant surgeon, a, a very successful, a creative uh, uh, surgeon scientist, and uh, and uh, and uh, and is really fast in getting getting idea into into projects and products. So it is my 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 pleasure to. Uh, Give you the floor, Ronan, to talk about the clinical experience with this uh, PORSA project in the laparoscopic field. Thank you, Savannah. Uh, thank you, Bert Bernard and Debbie. It's lovely to be uh, in this webinar. It's lovely, though, to have done this work with you. And it, as you know, it's continuing. What a fascinating project it has been. It's great to work with great engineers. And uh, we're, we're lucky that Kevin Nolan is in our, in our lives, too. It's really, it's really been an education for me to see some of the imaging that can be created outside of surgery. We're used to seeing lovely pictures inside op operations, but to see it outside. Um, yeah, I'm going to share the results of the clinical trial. Uh, I hope the slides are going to be appearing now and in PowerPoint. You might, um, can I just check that they're Perfect. up? Perfect. You can see? 
Yes. Yeah. So we're talking in this area now about leaks through trocars, gas leaks, uh, carrying gas, carrying particles, carrying whatever is circulating in that inter interdomal space. Uh, this is one of these really compelling images that Kevin has created around a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. There's a laser uh, giving a 2D light slice over that operative airspace. And you can see uh, gas getting up into the breathing zone of the surgical team and, uh, of course, the whole, the whole op op operating team. You can also even see some particles. You see those scintillations as the laser strikes certain sized particles coming carrying up into it. Uh, that's only a 2D slice, though, through it. And if you put a particle count, you get some sense of the fog that we all op operate in. So um, there's, there's some millions of particles. And particularly those smaller size microns, they're the ones that can get in and around your mask. And as you inhale them, they go into the alveoli and they can go into the circulation. So these, these are the ultra fine particle sizes. Um, now, this is terribly important for surgeons because although we think we're operating in, in um, positive pressure rooms, when we crowd the operating field, and this is simulated surgery here, but when we push people and laparoscopic tires and energy stacks around the field, you see there's that tendency to stagnation uh, rather than clearance of the downward pressure of it. And those videos even show the effects of the operating lights from earlier in, in the webinar show that we really are working in that kind of stagnant gas space of the operating room, like, like a blind spot. So uh, this is kind of the type of imaging that uh, Kevin has made. Uh, of course, it's traditional, it's clearing, um, but he's miniaturized it to allow the PORSAT project to happen. But I'm just going to show you some of the images we have of Sclerin and, and then how that is, is working in the PORSAT trial. So uh, this is looking at differences in light density, uh, as might be cre created by uh, carbon dioxide leaks happening around, around the operating room. So in these simulation models, you can see all types of leaks happen around trocars. Tro tro and this type of one, that deliberate venting of gas is, was a focus of those surgical guidelines for um, safety of surgical teams. And I think we can all do a better job of being mindful about how we vent gas into the operating room um, and be careful of, of uh, things like uh, taking ports out in a distended, insufflated abdomen. We should, of course, desufflate the abdomen before we before we take trocars tro tro out. Um, we should be careful, of course, that the incisions are snug around the trocars because that kind of mismatch can um, cause gas leakage. And the gas leakage brings with it uh, particles. And that sort of turbulent gas leaks that you can see now really create a, a lot of velocity and trajectory for, 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 for the particles. So that's really, I think, what the guidelines had focused on. Um, but these kind of ones are a bit trickier. You know, this is, uh, this of course is an inbuilt problem with our surgical techniques. Fine to put the first troker in in a desulfated abdomen, but every other troker then goes into a descended abdomen. And as we take the obturators out of the trocars, uh, it carries with it a uh, plume of gas up from it. Um, some, 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 some trocars and their obturators have holes and hollow spaces in them. So really, no, no matter how mindful you are, no, no surgeon can, can avoid these, these type of, um, of gas leaks. Uh, putting optical trocars in as well, uh, particularly with the gas on, can, can cause it. But also with the trocars, is this tendency for them to leak gas every time an instrument goes in and out of the valves. I mean, of course, the valveless tro trocars will leak all, all the time, but valved tro tro trocars themselves uh, cause these kind of gas spurts. And I don't think surgeons necessarily need to see this because we hear this constantly during the operation, that little sound uh, as we put the, the trocars in and out tells us that there is gas escaping and that gas can bring particles with it. So really we haven't seen uh, guidelines being, being able to mitigate these kind of problems as happened with commodity items like, uh, like, like trocars have become. Um, one of the lovely things about Slaren though is that you can quantify things like the velocity um, and here's the red particles that you see is, is the highest velocity particles. And the type of gas leaks coming out of the trocars are equivalent to uh, human speaking or even maybe a, a, a cough. And we're used to kind of seeing in the COVID pan pandemic the importance of, of managing um, coughs around, around other people to it. So it's the velocity um, that really is going to ex expel particles up into our breathing zones. Um, and that's really what we're focusing on in the measurements in PORSAV. 
Here's another dose type type of tool. This is near infrared imaging. Uh, this is a FLIR ca camera, which has uh, come from background in, in military applications. And then an industrial carbon dioxide gas leaks assessment as a handheld type of cam recorder, which shows you the carbon dioxide leaks happening around it. And again, we see in laparoscopy and robotic assisted surgery that we constantly have this uh, fog or smog of, of material around us. You see it leaking through the hollow parts of the instruments, the energy device and come out the handles, comes out through, through, through the robotic arms. So really these are, um, these are, these are continuous um, gas effluviums coming up into, into our, our, our breathing zones. So uh, this is how it looks in the operating room. So what we're moved then is taking this methodology and applying it in a series of cases in Dublin and in IRCAD too, as you know, so, so um, there's the Sleeran and there's the FLIR. The FLIR gives this overview of, of all, all of the trokers, whereas the Sleeran can focus in on one in particular, and then we can use that to quantify it, uh, understand the importance of the, of the gas leaks, um, and feed into some of the simulation models that Kevin has made too, to help inform about trocar dis design. So the patient is positioned, uh, the, the uh, Sleeran systems can come, come in on wheeled trolleys, uh, the camcorder FLIR sets up too. So we're, we're looking at this uh, carefully with sensitive me me methodology in two different ways. Um, and this is what the, uh, what the PORSAV project has been about, is not just identifying or characterizing gas leaks, but also de de dealing with them. As uh, this is the main issue with, ma with minimally invasive operations. We operate under positive pressure and any gas leak will bring uh, materials out under pressure to it. Uh, here's a Pagliari device, the, the leak trap. Uh, it's a rather simple concept, but it's very nicely engineered. That the vacuum ring placed um, just at the base of the trocar at the time of insertion, and a second vacuum ring up at the atrium. So this the concept here is that these can be applied to any trocar by any manufacturer, and a gentle continuous vacuum can be applied and um, eliminate or deviate some of those gas leaks because gas leak up is the vertical gas leaks really are the ones that get into our breathing zones whereas keeping gas leaks down along the um the, the the abdomen or down towards the floor is of course a much safer way to do it so these type of rings are applied to every trocar uh, these are a series of laparoscopic cholecystectomy cases and we're imaging externally with the sclerin device and with the flur system um, here you see the second one going in, it's, it's really rather straightforward. And although the tubing might look a bit of a nuisance, uh, it doesn't impair the uh, instrument movement uh, around it. So here you can see a um, instrument's being inserted into the leak trap. Uh, when you disrupt the valves, of course, there can be gas coming through it like a, a suture on a, on a specimen bag. Um, and this is the FLIR imaging happening simultaneously to the Sclearing imaging. Um, so we'll show you the um, what a control leak looks like. This is a trocar in a in a laparoscopic colostectomy. You see these type of leaks happen uh, out with it. This is without the leak trap device on it. Um, as we this this is a swab that you might use to clean the clean the the, the trocar before putting in the port. And you see quite a lot of. Uh, vortex gas coming out of it. When you put the leak trap devices on, uh, you really you, you can see in, in this case, there's really no, no, no leak at all, uh, or perhaps a slight little horizontal cough of gas coming out, but certainly nothing that is uh, threatening the breathing zone of the, um, of, of, of the surgical teams. The next video will just show again a, a slight, a, a deviated gas stream because of those um, suction that's, that's been applied. Um, mostly the problem being up at the valves of the, of the trocars. Small little uh, cough there coming out, quite, quite different to what we were seeing be, be before. So um, this type of you know, dual modality imaging creates a lot of information as anyone looking at videos will, will know. And although uh, we haven't finished the analysis of the clinical series yet, and then indeed the clinical series is still ongoing, here's just some interim analysis. So if we split up those type of leaks into maybe uh, four type of categories, 
But the class three ones are those high velocity plumes that carry um, materials up into the breathing zone of the patients, of, of, this, of the operating team. And then the, and zero is no leak. So really the issue is how many class three leaks are happening with or without the leak trap. And this is the type of uh, information that we're seeing. So if we take the first 12 cases, uh, six patients on the control group, six at the intervention. Uh, it's, a, it's a teaching hospital. Often these are acute cases too. So the operations are taking a mean of about an hour. Um, I guess doing the imaging ads, maybe five minutes on to each case too. You can see the number of instrument exchanges are, are considerable in both the control group and the leak trap group uh, with the mean of, of 30 instrument exchanges happening per, per case and quite well balanced with between the two groups. But there's really a big, big difference in the type three leaks happening. So um, that happens in about 46% of cases of the trocars, particularly as you can see on the left-hand side of the graph, later in the case, I guess is the valves are, are fatiguing and not quite causing the same seal as they do earlier on. Although actually there are even still some, some type three leaks earlier in the experience, almost as soon as you start operating. Um, uh, whereas in the leak trap case, that type three leak has really dropped down to uh, in the, into the range of, of two percent. So this are these. I mean, we've got much more an, an analysis to do to kind of build out the story of of uh, what's happening and, and what that means. But uh, in summary, I think what we can see from this work already is that these sort of gas leaks, effluvias, and aerosols are are really common in laparoscopic surgery, and it's part of the of our milieu of, of, of where we stand and, and where we operate. Uh, imaging methods can be applied in inch intraoperatively uh, during operations to help people understand and see these, these leaks. But importantly, they can quantify these leaks. And although these leaks are significant, they're modifiable. Um, true, simple, true smart, and John, I hope you forgive me if I say rather simple, elegant, of course, but simple en engineering methods that can be applied two trocars to better our OR environment. Because really, I mean, the, the time surgeons pay attention to trocars at the start of the case. And then of course they have to focus on doing the operation then uh, and can't keep coming back to kind of check how the trocars are, are, are doing. So certainly we should be uh, better able to conserve carbon dioxide, but safer for whatever our concerns is, whether it's, it's uh, carcinogenic, uh, materials, potentially cancer cells or micro, my, my, microbial diseases. And although COVID hasn't proven to be directly spread by this way, it'd be simply awful if we get shut down again by some other future pandemic, because we still haven't yet addressed that constant uh, nuisance of gas leaks in surgery. So really interested in your thoughts and it's been a, it's been a great project to be involved in. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ronan. A fantastic talk. Uh, it seems like uh, we were thinking only about COVID, but we opened a whole can of worm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. And, I, I, and I almost feel that, you know, in our homes, we have smoke detectors uh, to prevent fires. So we should have the same thing in the UR because today we have some measures that are in place, like filters and positive pressures, as, you, as, uh, as all the previous speakers and you too, you mentioned. But uh, uh, we cannot visualize, there is not a way to actually measure the amount of smoke that is in the OR and where is the smoke and what kind of smoke. And uh, the slurring uh, uh, technology and flare are not exactly something that, as they are today, are, are, uh, are amenable in all our ORs. So I'm very curious to see uh, what is your... Uh, uh, insight into the future, what should we do? So that's my first question. And the second question is, and is, it is also for the panel, now that we see and now that we know, shouldn't we adapt also the occupational medicine checks, routine checks uh, for, for, for surgeons and for the OR personnel to check for the damage induced by the surgical smoke? Uh, gosh, yeah. I mean, the, the the I mean, what's interesting, and we heard it. We heard a very nice talk about explaining how operating rooms work. But I mean, like they're built. That's but the room is designed. You know, the the, the the dust monitors are on the wall, or the carbon dioxide monitors are on the wall, and the positive pressure works. It's just it's just we then distort those airflows in surgery 
by uh, moving, by having people standing around as a, a focused space for some time, and by pushing all that equipment into it. So really, it's it's monitoring that air space. I think we probably haven't quite done yet. Maybe a little badge that people might wear, perhaps on it. But uh, yeah, the occupational aspects of this are are really quite interesting, aren't they? Not so much for surgeons coming in for one or two days a week, but uh, but I'm sure for that kind of continual day by day exposure, people don't like seeing this so but the, the point of the project isn't to show people a problem that we can't do anything about the point of it is of course to solve it and maybe we don't need to wear any type of monitors if we just actually deal with these uh with these kind of gas leaks coming to it you know so john is very elegantly shown and quickly pr prototyped and brought towards market one method i'm sure there's other methods too that, that that can be dealt with but really i'd much rather not see these things they can't be unseen now but I really would much rather these things not not happening. But that's that's all that's all, all I'm going to say. And I'd love to hear the rest of the panel. Yeah, it's it's very interesting uh, because uh, I don't know if it's still the case, but uh, it was used to be uh, in England. People, the surgeons were not wearing any protection while doing surgery. Uh, so, uh, how does it change uh, because of the COVID? Is it changing now? People are wearing this protective mask or yes or no uh yeah i'm sure that's right i mean i think i mean my understanding of wearing masks was, was to protect the patient from me yeah. you know so we wouldn't be infecting the wounds with a dribble and spit yeah. um but you know in those masks you often see splatter do you know there is there is some little red are or, or on your glasses you do see so so there is there is things coming out of the patient into us um some specialties have been very focused on this haven't they the gynecologists um in particular but uh, yeah, I remember working in, in Oxford and if it was a lap case, they really were very pleased not to wear masks. They do now. We have uh, two questions from uh, the audience. Um, the first one is that, um, Professor Kale, um, it seems that the leak trap applies a little bit more pressure on the skin of the patient where you place uh, the trocar. And so they ask if, uh, um, do the patient uh, uh, refer more pain after the surgery yeah no we haven't we haven't really seen that it's it's, it's an adhesive strip that uh, attaches onto it um i'm not sure if you want we can kind of go back and look at that video again perhaps um <clears throat> but it, 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 i haven't noticed any redness around the abdomen or I haven't noticed any any more any more pain about it but it's a it, it, it is a good point yeah sure we haven't we haven't seen that but it's quite gentle. I mean, you could pull these things off, you know, it's at the fulcrum of the, of the trocar, but, you know, so it doesn't tend to come off during the case, but they're not hard to take off afterwards. There isn't a kind of a, there isn't a, yeah, there isn't a, a big t tension on the skin. I, don't, I, I, I haven't seen. Okay. And the second question is, uh, how much is the cost of the air trap, uh, uh, leak trap system? Oh yeah, John. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Ah, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, is going to be double digits rather than triple digits. I mean, there's actually, it depends how many trokers you want, you know, I mean, the basic kit would be for um, a troke for a single trocar, and then if you want it for two or three trokers. Uh, the other thing I, I would say is that, you know, as, as we go on, it may be that you only really want to use them on the, the top of the trocar, that the leaks at the base of certainly the five millimeter trokers mightn't warrant the expense. But I think as the analysis comes out, we'll get a, a better sense of that. So, I mean, this is a this is kind of a, a double digit rather than a triple digit solution, put it that way. Yeah, I have, I have a question to run on. <clears throat> we know that uh, you mentioned the size of the incision when we are inserting the trocars. And I know that <clears throat> some people are doing open approach, so they're doing very large incision, and of course it's leaking. But for those people who are for for the accessories for cars or for the people who are using <clears throat> a blind technique, um, have you ever looked at the importance of the skin incision, where usually you have the friction with a trocar, and the fascial incision? So my question is that if you do a quite normal skin incision, but you don't do any incision of the fascia while inserting the trocar, does it make a difference? Uh, I think that's a great point. We haven't really specifically looked at that. 
And when you do look at that in the lab with kind of porcine cadaver material, I, I don't think it's reflective of the human because it doesn't have the same elasticity at, at all about it. But I do, I mean, there was a huge, wasn't there a tension to correct trocar placement as laparoscopy was being de developed and people really, really paid attention to it. And I think we've lost a lot of that. It's, it's, it's sort of become the sort of the, the, the brainless bit of the operation. I, I think, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I think we should go back to that careful attention to detail because it, I'm sure it's better for uh, the patient, the choker shouldn't be slipping out of them. But I think I, I, I'd be interested in your thoughts. You've, you've seen this from start to, to finish the whole laparoscopic story. Uh, do you think people are paying less attention to that setup? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I don't know, the B maybe. I think they're paying less attention to it now. Mm. Yeah, me too. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And especially the more experience you get, the less attention you you play, and mm -hmm. uh, and probably your your residents and fellows are placing the trocar, and you're yeah. coming only for bits and pieces of the operation. And uh, and uh, but but I think that uh, it's, I'm it's a very good point. I'm paying a lot point. of attention to that. Yeah, you. you, you, yeah. you, you yeah. It's true. I don't know why, but uh, uh, that's something that I'm trying to. Uh, to teach uh, to the to the young is the way you're doing the skin incision, the way you're respecting the fascia, etc. But I, I would be very curious to to try to analyze a little bit the importance of these different factors using the Schlieren system. That that would be nice. Yeah. Lovely, yeah, it'd be great. But I do think you know it's difficult, particularly in training and with junior people. Like you can't just beat up all the time on the surgeon to do it better all the time. You know because these sort of just sticking a hollow straw into the patient should have some you know tolerance for if you make a mistake or if you're inexperienced to it I, you know I, you know i think i think there has to be a bit of evolved trocar work not not to make them extraordinarily expensive or sophisticated but i think really they they should allow us to be human and focused on other parts of the case and not having to come back and check all the time i i, I really do think that so I, I, I ah, guess yes, yes so, that I will introduce myself. No, no, <laughs> uh, no, no I, was, I was just uh, thinking about the, the, the comments of Ronan, uh, which are uh, very important. And uh, of course, we will move to the last uh, lecture. And we've been talking about smoke, uh, about aerosolization, etc. And uh, you know that uh, surgeons are also doing sometimes uh, flexible endoscopy, gastroenterologists are doing flexible endoscopy, and uh, we never looked really uh, at the problem associated with the uh, flexible endoscopy until the COVID came out. Uh, then we realized that we have a lot of aerosolizations, and very recently we uh, published a study with uh, one of our Korean fellow uh, this, that shows you, you're going to show that? Yes. Okay. So Sylvana will talk about that. The smoke in uh, flexible endoscopy is something that is also very important. So I leave the ground to, uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, to Sylvana Peretta. So everybody knows Sylvana Peretta. Who's, uh, she's professor of surgery in, uh, in the Hospital of Strasbourg. Uh, laparoscopic surgeon, flexible endoscopic surgeon. So uh, she's the right person to talk about another way to protect people while doing uh, flexible endoscopy. Thank you, Sylvana. Thank you very much, uh, Bernard. So I'm going to focus on uh, uh, what uh, we developed in order to protect uh, the uh, the personnel, uh, the uh, endoscopist and the nurses and the anesthesiologists or anesthesia tech while doing uh, endoscopy. Um, endoscopy is an aerosol generating procedure. I love when Ronan talks about surgical plume or effluvium, we get splashes. We get totally covered in all sorts of uh, uh, bodily fluids that I'm not going to comment on today, but you really have a high risk of being um, uh, infected when you're doing uh, endoscopy. And um, uh, if, if the patient is under sedation and anesthesia, it does make a difference because if the patient is coughing or moving or, or choking during the procedure, of course, you increase the risk that you have to, uh, to be splashed or to be um, covered in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in particles. Uh, what we do know also is that this risk concerns the operator, the people who are standing next to the operator, but also you can find different kinds of bacteria uh, and germs on the walls of the, um, of the uh, uh, operating uh, uh, suits or, 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 or in the OR. 
And uh, what's really impressive is that uh, most operators are not aware at all of being splashed. And uh, Bernard was saying in England, surgeons were not wearing masks. I remember very well when I was uh, doing my fellowship at UCSF in the US uh, that gastroenterologists didn't wear anything. They would come uh, very elegantly dressed up with their tie and their nice iron shirt and their shoes and then walk and see, you know, go home, see their kids or whatever covered in whatever they they were exploring in in their patients so uh, this is something that was not uh, very well uh, eradicated in the um, GI culture to protect yourself and to ask your personnel to protect themselves uh, uh, when doing endoscopy and this includes also manipulating the endoscope before and after the procedures wearing gloves which is something that uh, we know very well as surgeons we never touch anything in on an OR table even afterwards or in the OR in general without wearing gloves uh, and, and nurses in the endoscopy rooms do everything without gloves so a lot to learn from surgery during the COVID a lot of attention was of course concentrated also also on endoscopy and only on surgeons to the point that uh, uh, endoscopy was considered only an emergency procedures or done only for emergency cases during COVID. Um, uh, we do test all our patients uh, before endoscopy to see if they are positive to COVID-19 uh, since the pandemic has begun. So, we talked about upper GI procedures, but lower GI procedures and ERCP procedures are all risky uh, and can all generate uh, potentially infection uh, uh, particles. What we do know, and Bernard was mentioning, is also that we produce a lot of, of endoscopy or endoscopic surgical smoke. And this is something that is even worse uh, when we are performing a ESD and endoscopic submucosal dissection, for instance, of the colon or of the mouth, because we don't have a trocar. Actually, the mouth is our trocar or the anus is our trocar. So you have a lot of gas coming out of the patient with a lot of fluid, a lot of effluvium, a lot of splashes. And splashes not only contain potentially uh, bacteria or viruses, but they do contain a lot of uh, um, uh, components that can be cancerogenic to us and to the OR personnel. Uh, Dr. Uh, Watanabe was talking about uh, volatile compounds that can be found. Uh, well, um, a lot of those compounds are so high in the endoscopic generated smokes that the uh, air policy control would actually forbid you from stepping into the OR. If you had the same thing in the air that you breathe, you wouldn't go out of your home and they would ask you to close the windows and stay home. So that's the kind of polluted environment we work every day. Uh, and of course, Ronan said it very well, uh, instead of correcting the behavior, instead of uh, addressing the issue of wearing masks, we should stop the problem at the root and just uh, uh, find solutions that will make what we do safer for all the personnel. That's what uh, we did together with the consortium of the uh, PORSAF project. We created a, uh, an endotrop device that is trapping uh, uh, the fluids uh, and the splashes uh, and the plumes coming out of the patient. It consists of a soft mask that is uh, uh, covering uh, the face of the patient, the mouth and the nose of the patient. Uh, a filter that is filtering the, uh, the, the air and the gas generated by the procedure itself, protecting uh, the, uh, the environment uh, from potential hazards. And also a sheet that is uh, um, uh, covering uh, the, um, the endoscope uh, and uh, and uh, uh, all the way up to the um, uh, the handles. Here you see uh, how we would normally do a, a an upper GI procedure, and uh, in in a, in, a, in a couple of seconds you will see uh, the endotrap device. It's very easy to mount. Uh, it takes uh, literally uh, one minute. You have the mask, which is very soft. It's a standard anesthesia mask uh, that you could use with a, an ambu balloon. Uh, you slide the endoscope uh, into uh, the, uh, the device and then you just pull to cover all the endoscope and there is a something that is very similar to the sheet that you would use in your laparoscopy to protect your, your the cables of your of your laparoscopic camera. You can see the filter and, and you can see that we can actually do 
uh, the, the procedures in the same way we would normally do a standard upper GI procedure. We don't have a device for colonoscopy. I know that Debbie is a colorectal surgeon and she does also endoscopies. Maybe we'll come, it will take a little bit of creativity to deal with that, but we will, we will, we will think about that um, also. I'm going to pass the floor to Pietro. Pietro, as I mentioned before, is our, is our uh, uh, newly uh, uh, acquired a brilliant mind here at IRCAD, uh, and uh, he's the one who's running with us the, uh, the Endotrap trial. So, Pietro. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for a very kind introduction. It's my pleasure to talk to you about the clinical trial. Uh, so first of all, this is a prospective randomized uh, uh, two-arm study. Uh, the aim of the study is to quantify the reduction in exposure of operating room personnel to potential burden, be a, be a burden during uh, endoscopic procedures using the endotrap. As you can see from the images, uh, we have the two groups, as said, one without uh, the endotrap device and one with the endotrap device. And uh, you, you see that endoscopist is always wearing a face mask. And it's uh, through the face mask that uh, we can quantify the uh, biohazard contamination. So we perform a swap uh, before uh, putting the face shield on the endoscopist to have a time zero of the potential uh, contamination of the mask. We remove all the safety uh, sheets uh, present on the mask and uh, then we perform the endoscopy. At the end of the endoscopy, we remove uh, the face shield from the endoscopies and before performing uh, the final uh, swap, we do a high resolution scanning of the, of the face shield to see if uh, there are present uh, any macro droplets on the, on the shield. And so uh, these are the results from uh, uh, the preliminary results. So at the end, we are going to enroll 98 patients. So far, we enrolled 13 patients. And we are very happy to see that uh, there are no statistical, statistical differences between the two groups in terms of age, in terms of uh, procedure length, and in terms of uh, contamination before the endoscopy. But as you can see, uh, we have a statistical differences between the the biocontamination after the procedure in the, the, uh, in the group where we use the endotrop device. So even with this uh, small amount of patient, we can have, uh, it's nice that we have a, a statistical uh, significant result. And um, another thing that we checked is the number of instruments uh, used during uh, the procedure because we thought well, that uh, putting inside and outside uh, an instrument from the valve could change something, but as you can see, there are no differences in the two groups. And uh, we finished just with the maneuverability uh, scores, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, in mo during most of the procedure, uh, the endoscopists agree that endotrap did not affect uh, endoscope maneuverability and did not make the procedure more difficult to perform. Actually, the score number three is, uh, w was uh, placed during the first procedure because uh, at the beginning it's maybe a little bit more difficult to intubate the patient with the device on, but then it, uh, it becomes very easy and uh, no adverse uh, event uh, have been recorded. Thank you. Thank you, Pietro. I just want to add that uh, when we do this procedure under sedation, of course, the anesthesiologist is there and they didn't complain, which is an important part of the team. So they yeah. were totally fine. And actually, since uh, we have uh, uh, nasal high flow oxygen, the fact of wearing a mask uh, uh, intensify the oxygenation of the patient. So that's something that uh, it's, a, it's a positive side effect of, uh, of the whole device. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, very interesting. So, Debbie, I'm pretty sure that you have some comments, question. Are oh. you performing flexible endoscopy? Yes. Colonoscopy? Yes. Okay. And what's your feeling about this system? Because I know that in the colon use, you can have also some problems. Sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we are not known to be dry endoscope. <laughs> I do tend to wear scrubs, but the gastroenterologist for that, they do not wear scrubs, but everybody basically wears a gown over um, gloves, uh, eye protection, um, but nothing as wonderful as this instrument. And we use an Alexis retractor transanal. I, I, I'm sure that we could do something to protect ourselves using this. So looking forward to the final results and seeing where it goes next. And uh, I, I'll ask a question because I'm um, talking about the Alexis uh, retractor. There's a participant that is asking if there is a leak trap device for single port surgery. 
Oh, good question. John? Um, not yes, uh, not yes. Um, it makes uh, sense to have one, uh, but we, I suppose we're still just going all through this clinical study to really understand the the value, the need, and um, I mean, both for transanal and for single port, it would be, transanal would be very much a replication. It's more the attachment mechanism needs to change, um, but the, for single port would require a little more thought. Just just one point on endotrap, you know, we're often asked is, well, you know, why don't you just put a seal in the mask? You know, why do you need that long sleeve going along the length of the scope? And the reason for that is is very much to, not cause friction when you're using the endoscope because if you have a seal it will cause friction and if you don't have a if you don't have friction you probably don't have a good seal so the idea here is that you know there's no seal within the mask the sleeve essentially captures anything and then it pushes up onto the the proximal section of the endoscope so that's the reason why we you know there are some ideas out that have been put out there around using a seal in the mask but you know for maneuverability we felt that not to have a seal there you know really when you're using it you don't know it's there you know once you've got the intubation done and, and, and John, what I uh, would like to add to what you're saying is that another positive side effect uh, of, of this is that when you look to uh, at the shield, once you have done your procedure, you see that it's full of fluid, actually. So there is a lot of uh, particles that are captured into the, uh, the plastic sheet that is covering the scope. So uh, it's not only a matter of friction, I think it's actually protecting more uh, uh, from from uh, splashes. Good point. Pietro, question. Last question uh, uh, for Professor Peretta: Is the splash from endoscopic submucosal dissection the same or uh, um, increased uh, than the one that we can have in poem or G poem? I think it should be uh, that more than splashes. We're talking about surgical smoke, and I think it's a uh, uh, it's uh, it really depends on uh, the length of uh, of the operation, the duration of the operation. Uh, I would say probably a little bit more in ESD than in that in poem, <coughs> also because of the location you're working within a tunnel, which already acts like a flap, and there is actually a mucosal flap protecting yourself. And we are we are. Um, being extremely careful in endoscopy about the setting that we're using. Uh, so uh, I think that the, 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 the for, for one thing, the evolution of the, uh, the different kinds of monopolar cautery or, or mixed uh, energy device that are used in endoscopy to work through such tiny instruments is a, a more sophisticated level than what we have with monopolar cautery in, in surgery. So I, I don't know if uh, Dr. Uh, Watanabe is still online. Yes. Yes. Do you have some comments on that, on this technology? What, 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 what is your opinion about that? Does it make you sense? Might... Yes, I, I think it's very, it makes sense. So I, I was so surprised, you know, the endoscopic procedure generates a, a lot of surgical smoke that I, I've run a lot. Thank you. We, we, we ask one final question to the audience uh, to know if they to understand whether they were aware of the danger and the hazards related to surgical smoke and 67% uh, uh, of them said yes, but 33% uh, uh, of them said no. So uh, I think that 33% is a large a percentage. It's a lot and uh, hopefully this this webinar has helped them to uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, raise the awareness uh, level and maybe take action also in their OR. Debbie, some final comment? I just thought it was a really eye-opening presentation. As we end, I will learn how to turn on my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> just a very eye-opening presentation, and it's good to know what we don't know and equitable solutions that are coming out to keep us all safe. So thank you all. Thank you very much. So time is passing. Uh, it's almost 3 p.m. in uh, Japan. So... <laughs> <laughs> AM, AM, uh, sorry, AM in Japan. So uh, that's why I asked I this question. Uh, 
Yeah, I take a day off tomorrow. So uh, that's why I asked you this question just to check if you were sleeping or not. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's that's the end of this very interesting webinar. And in fact, the more we're talking about this problem, the more evident it becomes. And uh, that's why we will still repeat this sort of uh, webinar probably within the next three months because there are a lot of issues that still have to be uh, discussed. Uh, we will keep you aware of the final results of the clinical trial, both in, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, Dublin, Ireland, and in, in France, here in Strasbourg. Uh, we will look at different options, checking the uh, leaks with the uh, imaging systems that we have today. So it's a very, very fascinating uh, new word for, for the uh, surgeon. Uh, for the uh, endoscopist, so uh, we'll keep you aware. And uh, thank you for for being with us uh, during this uh, this session. And uh, really, thank you for the speakers because uh, I really enjoyed that a lot. Uh, thank you, Debbie. Uh, thank you. Debbie is with us for some months, so we use her as much as possible, <laughs> and uh, it's always very very impressive. Uh, of course, Silvana, you know Silvana, Pietro. Thank you very much. And of course, John and the uh, Irish team, Ronan, uh, who are really at the uh, origin of this, uh, of this project. Thank you again for being with us and see you soon. Have a good night. Uh, have a good evening for some people. <laughs> and, see you, and see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.